2019, day two. We've got it going all day long here on the live stage. My name is Adam Swiderski. I'm the editor-in-chief of Sci-Fi Wire, which is your home online for content and commentary around all the movies and comics and games and all the things that we love and are celebrating here at Emerald City. Uh, I am joined today for an interview with someone whose career in the comics world has been long and storied. Yeah, I'm old now. Yeah. That was a nice. That was my nice way of, yeah, no, of no, saying that. You know, I used to be one. I used to be one of the young guys. I used yeah. to be one of the troublemaking young guys back in the day. Not but, anymore. <laughs> but welcome to the stage, it's good Doug to be here. Winnick. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for joining us. It's my pleasure. So, we got a lot to talk about. Like okay. I said, your career has been storied and varied. But uh, let's kick things off with Hilo. Yeah. Because we're on book five now. Yes. How's doing, that been? I'm doing a book a year. Yeah. It's like you know, and it's cool. Uh, I mean, it, it all started uh, about, fi uh, about five years ago. My, uh, uh, my son was seven at the time, and he, uh, he wanted to read some of my Batman comics. Literally, like, Dad, can I read some of your Batman comics? And I had said, you're seven, so no, you may not read my Batman comics. And explained to him, like, they're kind of for, like, you know, oh, like older kids and grown-ups. Um, so then uh, I tried to find something that was appropriate for him. I got him Bone. Um, he lost his damn mind for Bone. I know Jeff Smith, who does Bone. I told Jeff he lost his damn mind, and Jeff sent us two gigantic boxes of merch. Hats, t-shirts, action figures, and my son became a Bone super fan. And I got jealous. I was gonna say, is that now his expectation for every comic he reads from here on out? <laughs> he's just gonna get a massive gift box from the creator? He does pimp me now and again, like, yeah. do you know these guys? <laughs> like, who are these guys? Like, you maybe get some stuff for us? Yeah. But mostly has to be satisfied, like, no, Dad buys a lot of toys. I mean, you come to our house, you know, I've been doing this for like 20 years, so I've been accumulating regular, regular non-comic folks come over and say like, wow, look at all the toys, your kids are spoiled. Like, yeah, those actually aren't the kids' toys. <laughs> those belong to dad. They can most, mostly touch them, just, you know, not the statues, but everything else is cool. I think we can all relate to that. Do you have yeah. any mini busts? That's what I, that's always my favorite is the <laughs> mini busts. <laughs> we have lots of busts. We have three life-size Yodas. Wow. Three, and like, I'm not, even, I'm not even joking at all. Like, actually do. Like, one's in my office, one's in the den, one's in the entryway, I swear to God. That's amazing. <laughs> so, but, you know, we are on the fifth volume of yeah. Milo. How has the project evolved, I guess, for you as the creator over time, from book one to now? I've, it's, been, it's been a joy. I mean, I'm, I'm, I mean, from the beginning, I've always been a cartoonist, first and foremost. So the ability to, and chance to write and draw my own book uh, and also tell the story this way. You know, I'm telling a sequential story. One story leads to another. I mean, it's not a monthly. It's, an, it's, a, it's a yearly thing. And uh, with the sixth book, we're going to wrap up the first big major storyline. The book series is an ending, but with the sixth book, the whole big storyline of the first one ends. And then I'm going to pick up with an entirely new story with the seventh book. I mean, I've been like Knockwood. The, the books have done really, really well. So I get to keep making them. And, you know, I live like a 10-year-old. I make things up and I draw them in my basement. I mean, Not know. a bad way to make a living. It's yeah. cool. When I was a kid, I used <laughs> to, like, draw pictures while I half-watch television. Now I draw pictures while I half-watch television. That's my job. So it's great. So speaking about kids' entertainment or, or things that we create to appeal to kids, Yeah. how hard is it to strike the balance in that versus without taking away the suspense or the thrill element or stuff like that? I mean, is that, is that a hard balance for you? It's, you know what, it's really not. It, it means, it's all about how you think about it. Like some, some of the best movies around are Pixar movies, right? And uh, nothing makes the people at Pixar angrier than when you say they're, they're kids' movies. They're not, they're really all ages. They're really for everybody. And that's kind of what I'm shooting for. I mean, honestly, the only thing I change is that I kind of make sure I don't throw too many SAT words around no cussing, and I'm doing action, not violence. But aside from that, it's just as intense as anything I've ever done. I mean, now in the last couple of years, now that there's a bunch of volumes out, the adult fans have now started to take notice of Hilo, which is great. Um, so it's, it has actually become like the all ages series I planned on. Um, you just, if it's a good story, if it's funny, um, then you get to do your drama, then you get to have, tell like the ongoing story that really works. Yeah. It's funny because we recently, uh, my wife and I recently rented Return to Oz. Have yeah. you ever seen that film? Yeah. And it just got me thinking about kids' entertainment and how it's changed over years. I mean, that movie is messed up and dark. That was a particularly dark movie, And it yeah. feels like that was a period where people were not afraid to 
scare kids on a certain level. Yeah. I think of something like Something Luke This Way Comes. I don't know if you know that film. Yeah, I totally do. Yeah. I mean, I, I watched that when I was a kid, like, at home. Messed on me cable. up, man. Oh, it's terrifying. Yeah. In the right kind of way. Like, it's scary for everybody. Yeah. You know, and we can still can do uh, a lot of all ages genre stuff. I mean, that's when we were kids, because we're old people, um, right. you know. Story. We're story. Yes. Yeah. Uh, kids could, you know, we were reading Spider-Man and Superman, and everybody could read it, you know, Cradle to the Grave. And we kind of gotten away from that, uh, which is kind of what I wanted to do with this. It's just kind of get back to it, that everybody can read it. I mean, it's, it's, um, it's uh, all ages, I think, it has longevity, and it's, it's where we all learn to fall in love with story. Yeah. Like Star Wars. It's for everybody, right. you know? Still is. Do you feel like the comics industry, I guess, or there's been some discussion around the comics industry having a kid problem, right? And not, and losing a younger audience and not developing a new audience as the stories have matured. Yeah. You know, like you said, having, hooking those younger readers. Mm hmm But, you know, we have publishing houses like Scholastic and Random House doing these trade paperback. Right. Kids yeah. stories now. Do you, how do you feel about that trend? And do you feel like that, Think that trend is kind of reversed and we're getting more younger readers now in the comics world? I think so. I think, well, to be really, really blunt and honest, so they're like, I'd say in the 90s and then through the 2000s, um, we concentrated, you know, when it came to superhero stories and getting like very dark and very gritty. Now, I was one of those guys who made them very, very dark and very, very gritty. I was one of those guys. Um, and it took a little while to step back and just see that, that, you know, when we were kids, everybody read everything. I think, um, I think the comic book industry probably is realizing that you know, you can, you can, when it comes to kids, when they grow up and they're no longer reading the kids' books, there's gonna be kids right behind them who are a couple years away from reading those books again. But we are not making young comic readers who are gonna go on to read the grown-up stuff. Um, they gotta start somewhere, and if, you know, and if they can't, like, if they can't pick up Spider-Man and Superman today and learn to appreciate it now, then they're not gonna do it in five years when they're teenagers or older. Yeah. You know, because cause we're, we're gonna die. You know, <laughs> we're old cats, you man. know? It's waiting right there. So Who's gonna read Batman when we're gone, man? That's true. Who's gonna do it? That is an important question, really. <laughs> um, so in the latest Hilo book, uh, yeah. you're kind of flipping the script a little bit, right? Because... Uh, Spoilers. I'm, is this a spoiler? I'm like, is, should is I not it, be talking I, about this? It, well, it, I, I don't know what you're gonna say, but I have a hit. I, it's funny, I, sp I talk at schools a lot. Yeah. And so when we come to Q&A, which it's like funny because they don't know from spoilers. Like, okay, if you have a question that happens to be a spoiler, I'm gonna say, that's a spoiler and come find me when I'm done talking and we'll talk about it. Right. And it's, it's awesome because the little guys don't know. I mean, it's not like they're blowing like, you know, so Darth Vader's Luke's dad. Like, ah, it's not <laughs> right. quite that bad, but. Um, so let's just say you've had a character who's done a lot of saving who might need yeah. some help in this. Can you talk a little bit about the inspiration for that particular arc? I, um, I think the inspiration for most of the endings in the books being cliffhangers and a big twist at the end uh, was purely my editor. I, I, for, for all the chops I'd had doing my monthly books, my editor, Shana Corey, when the first one came in, she said, I really, really love it. Like, we had notes and went back for it. I think you need a cliffhanger. And I came up with one idea and she said, like, that's not, like, maybe a little more. And, like, and then I had like a third iteration, like, this seems mean. She goes, yeah, it's the one I want. <laughs> I want them to put down the book and say, what, what? And then they got to wait a year. I go, that's, like, it's di like, that's a different mentality from doing it monthly. They only have to wait 30 days. She goes, it'll be fine. We'll live. It'll be great. So with each successive book, I tried to like make the cliffhanger worse. This fifth one's pretty rough. Yeah. yeah. Kids are resilient. They'll, they'll deal with it, right? <laughs> yeah. But, uh, and this has also been your return to the drawing table. Yeah. After writing a lot, yeah, you know, for uh, years or so. What's that experience been like? Was that a, was that a main motivation behind I, I, launching the book? I might have to lay down like we're on a shrink's couch. Yeah. But I, I mean, because it, it was almost like that. It was, it was a weird time. Like around, around the time my son was asking for like Batman, I sort of got the, the, the bug in my bonnet about maybe doing this. Um, I had done the math and I actually hadn't drawn anything like for real in about five years. And I was reaching this weird point where I was kind of unhappy. Um, and when I started drawing and writing again, it, it, I was so much better. Remember, my, my wife kept joking about like, no, no, it's like you just without like minus 60% misplaced anger, you're so much better. Yeah. It took a yeah. while to realize like, you know what? I'm actually a cartoonist, that's what I do. I can make up stories and I draw them. And that's, that's I me mean, again, like living like a 10 year old. It makes me happy. Yeah. 
It is. Do you find it a therapeutic thing? That drawing was that part of yeah. how you came to it in the first place? Oh well, just it's who I am. I mean, it's always what I wanted to do when I was like seven, and I read Garfield for the first time. That I decided I want to be a cartoonist. It's always what I wanted to do. Like segueing out and like writing for comics and TV and other stuff. That just became an adjunct of like being a cartoonist. And for a while, when people would ask me, like, what do you do? It's like, I'm a cartoonist. Oh, have I seen anything you've done? Like, well, I'm mostly writing now. And I felt like a phony. Mm. Um, this is kind of who I am. This is where I'm happiest. It's like, it's beyond therapeutic. I, um, oh, folks ask me, do you have any hobbies? Like, I don't. I, you know, I, I, the, the, my work is what I, gives me, like, the greatest pleasure. Like, I draw things, you know. Big, you know, and if, if, if I want to be happy, like, I think I want to draw, like, big giant Ron monster robots. So I'll make that part of the story. Yeah. You know, it's cool. Cool. Um, so, but speaking about that transition, right, yeah. from, from cartooning to writing in the superhero world specifically, I want to go back and touch on a couple of the key moments sure. uh, in, in that part of your career. Uh, the first being your first superhero book, yeah. Green Lantern. Yeah. What was the motivation, I guess, behind taking the plunge into that world? And then what was that experience like for you coming from a life as a cartoonist into <laughs> the big superhero comics space? It was a little bit terrifying, uh, but I had people had faith in me. I had just finished, um, I, did, I did a graphic novel called Pedro and Me, um, and my friend and later editor Bob Shrek was one of my first readers. I had met him at, comic, at San Diego Comic Con like in 96, so I gave him like what I considered the finished draft. He read it, he dug it, he was actually, uh, he was the head of Oni Press at the time, and he's the one who told me, like, go get a mainstream publisher. If nobody wants to do it, we'll publish it. But try to get a mainstream publisher. And after that, we stayed in touch. And then two years later, he was at DC. And that's when he came to me and said, look, so I was talking with Ron Mars. And Ron Mars is thinking about leaving Green Lantern. And we'd like you to write the book. Like, yeah, what? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, so how do you feel about that? Like, I, it's like, he goes, let me ask you, do you like superhero comics? Like, I do. Like, I've read them my whole life, Bob, which like, just never came up. It's like, do you like Green Lantern? Like, very much so. It's like, OK, so why don't you write it? Like, kick around some ideas, write up some ideas, and then we'll do a couple of scripts, see what you do. It's like, okay, that's how this works, man? He goes, that's how it works. I'm throwing you in the deep end, start swimming. Um, and he and Mike Carlin like, were really good about notes and helping me out. And you know, three or four issues turned into the monthly gig, and suddenly I'm writing Green Lantern. It's just, you know, everybody needs a rabbi. In my case, it was Bob who like read Pedro on me, and then went to everybody and said, yep, trust me, I read this, he can write this, and he's gonna do it. Uh, but it was terrifying. But so much fun, you have yeah. no idea. Like the first time, like, and then Batman said, I'm writing, I'm writing what's coming out of Batman's mouth. It's, oh my God. Was Green Lantern a character that you had any particular <laughs> fandom of or affinity with, or did you have to kind of sit down and put yourself in that space? No, I, I dug it. I came in um, just a couple of years, like Hal Jordan into when Hal lost and became Parallax and into Kyle Rayner. Like that was my, that was my sweet spot. And uh, I was excited about the idea of doing Kyle Rayner because when I started writing it, I was in my mid twenties, and that's where he was. Um, and my my approach, I talked to Ron about. It, I said I kind of want to tap into like the Peter Parker aspect of it. And uh, Ron said, Yeah, that's exactly where he's at. That's where he should be. Um, so for me, that's what worked. Because um, and a lot. Of, I mean, a lot of it. I, I, I kind of made Kyle Rayner like a lot like me. I made him instead of like a painter and an artist. I made him a cartoonist and a graphic designer. Um, you know, he had lots of trouble with women. Just, you know, I knew from that a lot. You know, um, and you know, in a magic ring, it was the best. Yeah. So moving forward from that, you yeah. had a moment where you created something that became a big thing in the canon in the DC universe. Yeah. Which is Jason Todd's resurrection and uh, Life is Red Hood. Yeah. How did that come about? How did that idea come about? And how was the pitch for that idea? Was it something that people were excited about from the beginning? Uh, yes and yes. The idea came because I thought they were already doing it. I mean, I've, I've told this before, but when I was reading uh, Jeff Loeb and Jim Lee's Hush, they have a part where Hush reveals himself as Jason Todd. And like, I was like, I mean, like, I went to Lazarus Fifth, I'm back to life. It's like, oh my God, I was so blown away. And I saw the whole story like a like a hundred miles of broken road. I saw the opera of it. Like this is gonna be great. And then the next issue, they took it away. It's Clayface. It wasn't really Jason. Like, right. oh, okay, they can do that. So when uh, Bob Shrek and Dan DiDio uh, came to me and said, you know, we, we're thinking about you know you for Batman. What do you think? The first thing I said is like, I, I want to do Jason Todd. I want to bring him back. And uh, I actually had lunch with Dan DiDio 
in San Diego, and I pitched him most of the story all the way to the ending, which I probably don't want to give away the ending, but the ending was just Jason confronting uh, uh, Batman and Joker. Right. Um, and when I told like Dan my idea about that and the motivation is, I'm like, no, he's not, he's not enraged because he let him die. He's enraged because he let Joker live. Dan said, that's how it ends? I go, yeah, because, okay, we're going to do that. I said, you like that? He goes, I love that. We're going to go ahead and do that. Done. It's like, oh, okay. And after that, like, I, was, I knew I wasn't having any problems. Like, Dan and Bob were going to make sure that I was, like, <laughs> in a safe space for, like, hey, we're bringing back Jason Todd. Like, yeah, and here come some death threats. You know, <laughs> people were not happy about the idea. I'm sure. Yeah, no, it was, it was, it was big. But what's that feel like? Because you're going from basically playing in this pool mm -hmm. that other people have built almost. I mean, you're, make, you're, you're making your contributions, like you said, to the characters yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and how they live. But this is a major shift for the canon. How does that feel as a creator to be able to do that? It was a lot of fun. It was, it was more fun. I wasn't feeling any pressure. I, it, I felt like, this is fun. I get to do this. I love this story. I believe in this story. And um, I think only afterwards, like when the storyline was done, and the reaction started coming in, the trade came out, more people saw it, and people started tapping into, like, men and women, young men and young men were tapping into, like, the sort of emo quality of Jason Todd, and now we are, I don't know how many years later, and, you know, people are, are walking around dressed as the Red Hood, and, like, there's merch, and there's things, and it's sort of like, like, this is cool, it's really, really cool. I mean, the most, the douchiest Hollywood thing I do is if someone's dressed as Jason Todd, I go, here, here, move over here. Give everybody the camera. Like, who are you? Like, I'm Judd Winner. I created, J I, I created Jason Todd. Take the picture. Here we go. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> bye, bye. You know, yeah. I, I, I deeply enjoy you need, that. You need to start carrying, like, smoke bombs. So you a little bit of that. Then I'm out. Cloud of smoke <laughs> and be gone. Yeah. They'll wonder if it really happened. <laughs> um, okay, and then let's talk about Shazam. Yeah. Because this is, this is a little timely because we, we're, we're on the verge of Shazam hitting the big screen. Yeah. And Shazam is a character who you've done a lot of work with. Uh, in First Thunder and Trials of Shazam. What about that character appealed to you as a writer? Exactly what the movie is doing. For, I don't know, I'm thinking almost 15 years. Uh, uh, the entire decade I was in comics, when I would talk about it, I'd go like, yeah, no one's doing Captain Marvel quite right. Captain Marvel needs to be, it's like Superman meets big. They're missing that piece of it. Like, everyone's trying to make him into Superman, but he's not. He's still a boy inside. That's the interesting part. It's the interesting part that he's still a kid inside. Like, we should tap into that more. And when I had, like, my, like, four issues to do it, that was a blast. And uh, I always knew eventually when they come around to the movie, they'll get it. They'll get there. They'll, they'll, they'll understand that it's way more fun and unique for suddenly this, you know, this boy, this teenage boy to be saddled with all of this power, for good or for bad. So I'm really excited. I'm kind of thrilled that they're doing it in this way. It'll be sweet and it'll be funny. It's, it's cool. What do you think that people whose first exposure to the character through the movies will be surprised by? or will, Not that you've seen the film, but yeah. about the character himself. I think, I, I mean, I don't know squat. Right, I'm no, of course. I'm just guessing just like everybody else. But assuming it's faithful to the comic. Yeah, I, yeah. I think one thing they're going to tap into, I mean, they're obviously going to go the route that's going to be fun and funny, and there's a kid inside, Captain Marvel. Um, but I think when they start peeling back the layers, and they get into more of the magic aspect, you know, and all the aspect of the gods and whatnot and the power. And I think I'm hoping they get into that, you know, stuff that I try to get into, which is like, this is a huge responsibility for a kid. Like, too much, actually. Yeah. It's too much of a responsibility for a kid. This is actually wrong, you know, but he's got to do it now. He's given this responsibility. He's got to do it. So I hope they do that. I mean, I would like for them to do that. Yeah. Um, so you've worked in a lot of different media. Yeah. You know, you, you've cartooned, you've written comics, you've adapted your own comic for the screen. Yeah. Do you have a preference, or are there unique challenges with each one that really appeal to you? I think I've kind of come full circle, and I'm really happy. Like, when I started, uh, I wanted to, and I did, I wanted to do comic strips. I wanted to do a daily comic strip for newspapers. And uh, that was my life's goal when I was a kid. All the way through college, I did a daily strip when I was at University of Michigan, and that's what I wanted to do. And then I had an opportunity to, to eventually do that. Um, and around the time that I was doing the comic strip is when I was working on Pedro and me, and I got, I got not disenchanted, but I felt like creatively stifled that I think I wanted to tell bigger stories. Um, so I got away from like the all ages aspect of you know, comic strips, and then got into all this other stuff. And now here we are. Like, when I was doing Hilo, it only clicked, it only clicked in my brain that I was kind of back where I started when my daughter, and I'll say this without getting choked up, when my daughter, who's 10 now, she 
pulled collections of my comic strip out. So it was Frumpy the Clown's name of the comic strip. So we have two collections, which Oni Press put out. Um, she pulled them off the shelf and started reading them, and she really, really dug them. And I realized, like, oh, Hilo and this are the only things I've done that you can actually read. It's like, right, comic strips are all ages. Like, oh, I'm kind of back where I started. Like, I'm doing, I'm, I'm writing and drawing my own cartoons that everybody can read. Um, and it, it is where I'm happiest. And I, I've been lucky. I've got to scratch all the itches. I did an anime series. I've written superhero comics and done lots of grown-up stuff. And never say never. I'm probably going to do all other manner of stuff later doing other things. But the fact that my day-to-day -day is still making up things and drawing them and that everybody can read it, just, it just feels right. It feels like, oh, okay, you know, you know, that was my midlife crisis, thank God. It wasn't like, you know, you know, a girlfriend in a sports <laughs> car. It turned out or to be Or a ponytail, like, yeah. You know, it, just, it wound up being like, like my wife and I would joke about it, Like, yeah, your midlife crisis, going back to drawing cartoons. Right. This works for everybody. Everybody wins. But it almost feels like it's a hybridization, right? Because I, I don't know that high, or at least from my perspective, Hilo could, was, I guess, was it influenced or inspired at all by your work in the superhero space? Oh, totally. Superhero space? Yeah, no, I couldn't. It's it, the 10,000 hours I did doing superheroes absolutely 100% informed what I get to do with Hilo. It's yeah. a superhero story. I mean, the, the fun part is um, it, it kind of threw my editor when she had, like, what she thought was major notes. She's like, I read this part, and this isn't kind of working. I was like, oh, well, this character can do this, can we do that, and at the end, I'll, and then I'll bring it over here, and then we can do that part and move that over there. Like, did you, were you thinking of this before I asked? Like, no, no, I just, I just figured that out. Like, how did you, like... Because when you write superhero comics, someone's gonna come along saying you can't use Nightwing. <laughs> it's like, it's like, oh, okay. It's like you gotta rework it like in the next three days and rewrite that without Nightwing. Can you do that? Like, sure. You just have to. So uh, over a decade of doing that kind of stuff, and now like no one makes me change things. I can just do whatever I want. But it's still a superhero story. Yeah. And I had you know, a full 12 years of figuring out how to do that. Now I'm just doing it for everybody. Have you explored or do you have ambitions for Hilo to appear in any other format, whether it's animated, yeah. games, anything like that? I think, I mean, uh, uh, in the next year or so, we'll be talking to people about an animated movie, and I'm doing like, yeah, with a shrug. I mean, it's, we, I mean to be honest, we could, have, we could have sold the rights a little while ago, but I've worked in animation, and the story's very close to me, so I want to, I want to write it. That's the plan, is that I want to, I want to write it, I want it to be animated. Um, and I think, creatively, I had to finish the sixth book and finish the first big story, and like, okay, now I'm ready to start thinking about it as what would it be as a movie, you know, and how much of these first six books are gonna be part of it. So I absolutely want to see it as a movie because I think it would be fun. You know, it's the next evolution for it. Cool. Um, this is a little bit of a complex question. I'm a complex guy. Good, so hopefully okay, we get to there it. There we go. Yeah, bring it. No, but you've received some recognition uh, industry-wise for the work you've done on bringing certain types of characters. I mean, Pedro and me, obviously, hugely right. influential. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, Terry Berg in Green Lantern, mm -hmm. uh, Mia Dearden in Green, in Green Arrow. We heard a very interesting time when it <laughs> comes to representation in science fiction, but in comics specifically as well. Right. How do you feel about where we're, it's weird, because it's like, I feel like we're, we're seeing more different types of characters now than we've ever seen, but it's also feeling really hard, like hard and, yeah. and controversial. So how, how do you feel about where things stand? Now? Well, if we're talking about uh, the diversity of characters that we're seeing in comics, and we could, let's, let's be blunt, we're talking about more women, we're talking about more people of color, we're talking about uh, gay characters and lesbian characters, um, which um, being the pinko that I am, uh, I was doing that a while ago, right. and now it's happening. Uh, more and more, but there's also more pushback um, and loud pushback. I think that means that it's working. I mean, a lot of this is like opening wounds uh, in a way, and uh, that kind of hurts. Uh, and people are not going to necessarily be happy about it. <clears throat> I mean, a lot of it is just, it's just math. If you just look at who all the characters are that we know, all the superhero characters we know, they're almost exclusively white men. Almost exclusively, like the numbers are just huge. So now the fact that we're introducing other people into the mix, and yes, a lot of the characters are not wholly original characters. We're doing what we do in the comic industry, which is like, yeah, we take this character, sort of refashion it, and make it a version of this one and that one to introduce this character and like you know get them on their feet because introducing new characters are hard. And you know, it some of it's like it's. I think part of the, the problem that people might have is like when business. Uh, meets uh, changing stories for what they perceive as progressive reasons. Like, 
you need Thor to be a woman because if we just introduce a woman character, people are like, who's that? It's like, well, she's Thor. It's like, no, but Thor's like, they don't worry, Thor's coming back, they'll have both of them, and it'll be interesting, it'll become something else. It's, um, I think there's a lot of arguing going on because, well, because it's needed and it's working. It's exciting. Yeah. It's, it's, it's gonna stay ugly for a little while here and there, but for the most part, the folks who are making it ugly are just the loudest ones. But I will tell you, as someone who makes stories for kids, like, um, kids uh, really, without even verbalizing it, and even sometimes they do, they appreciate diversity. Um, kids of color uh, like seeing people who look like them in their books. And they should be able to look at superhero comics and see women and people of color and gay people and trans people. You know, that's, it seems crazy that in a genre that has, you know, blue-skinned aliens running around that we can't, you know, we can't have a few more Asian people here and there uh, in comics. Right. You know, I think, we'll, I think we'll manage. I think we'll be okay. We'll survive. <laughs> so as someone who was breaking these barriers, you know, 15, 16 years ago, yeah. you're, are you feeling optimistic about the way things oh, are yeah. going now? Oh, yeah, yeah, no. I, I, um, I, I don't want to come off like, like, no, I was like a freedom rider there, like, you know, right, no, uh, desegregating, de uh, <laughs> you know, lunch counters and whatnot. Like, no, okay, so I was writing, like, I was, you know, putting people of color and gay people in comics a while ago. But the pushback then was pretty much the same as it is now, except the megaphone's bigger. Right. It used to be, you know, instead of, like, thousands of people on social media, it used to be hundreds of people on the message boards. Um, who just tear me a new one every day. Uh, I mean, you know, I hate to be like the old guy, but it's very much like, yes, when the haters weren't even called haters, when they were coming out of the primordial ooze and like a mud skipper, like coming out of the water and took its first gasp of air, the first thing it says like, Judd Winnick's Green Lantern sucks, like the first thing they said, right. you know. It's like, and that was, you know, in like year 2000. Um, so I think people communicated with sandwich boards, right, back then that they were. <laughs> Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> but, all right, well, it's been great having you on the stage. Where can people find you during the rest of the con? Um, I will be, uh, tomorrow, I'm going to be autographing at the autograph section on this floor over by University Books at uh, 515 and 615. Um, that's all I'm doing tomorrow. And I'll, I'll be hanging out here now if anyone wants anything signed as well. Excellent. Um, Thank you so much, Judd Winnick. Thank you, Adam. Check out Hilo. And coming up next on the live stage, we have Kickstarter Presents Kickstarting Your Comics. So if you're a creator, you're probably going to want to watch that one. Follow us on social media, hashtag it's a fan thing, hashtag ECCC. Stick around.